We've been doing quite a bit of work with GIZ over the last few years, and one of the products of that is this manual here that looks at agricultural development uh, agenda, a contemporary, uh, a contemporary agenda for agricultural development policy, which has more details of some of the things I'm going to be talking about over the next 25 minutes. Now look, I was given this exam question of being asked about rural transformation. So what am I going to try to cover in this? I'm going to talk a little bit about transformations and transitions. I'm going to talk about social differences. I'm going to talk about the policy agenda, which is implied by this. And throughout this, I'm going to be talking about principles, which will look fairly basic. So please bear with me if you're thinking, my goodness, I knew this when I was 16 years old. There are more complicated things that come. And then I'll be moving from those principles to some of the variations that we see. And I will put amongst this presentation a set of perspectives, a set of reflections, which I hope you will find uh, stimulating. And there's our basic uh, model that we're dealing with under transformations and transitions. The transformation is an economic transformation which takes economies with economic growth from economies which are primarily agrarian to economies in which manufacturing and services, and in particular higher value services, take up the majority of GDP. And as this takes place, agriculture declines, but declines relatively. Um, absolutely, agriculture has to grow but it's going to grow slower than the rest of the economy, so it grows relatively. So agriculture's share of GDP falls, and agriculture's share of employment falls. And in that schematic diagram there, you'll note that the share of GDP falls faster than the share of employment, which means the gap between average labor productivity in agriculture and the rest of the economy does tend to widen. Uh, with initial stages of economic growth, which is somewhat problematic. And the other side of this, of the transformations and transitions, is we move rather quickly from societies which are largely rural to societies which are largely urban. This is from the World Development Report for, when is it, 2009, on geographical changes, and they've got a, an index of agglomeration of urbanization on the vertical axis, GDP per capita on the horizontal. The big thing to note there is the move to largely urban societies happens rather quickly with economic growth. Before you've reached something like 4,000 uh, US dollars per capita, you've already moved to 50, 60 percent of the population uh, being urban. So look, uh, that is what we expect to see happening, and indeed, I know of no exceptions to these kinds of transformations and transitions. And the policy implication, we'll look at the detail in a while, is very simply this. If agriculture is to lose labor, and probably lose some land, and probably transfer some capital, and yet it has to grow, to be the initial driver of development in many cases and to support the development of the rest of the economy. The game is one of making more bricks with less straw and the only possible way to do this is to raise productivity. The big challenge is to raise land productivity, labor productivity and, le and productivity of capital and any other factors engaged. The first set of variations are the variations that one sees nationally. You can put those principles up there, but when you start looking at national histories of transformations, you see very different patterns. And I'm going to pick out three here just to give us some sense of the variations. Now, the first one I'm going to look at is the English experience. And the English experience is only important for one reason, that it's probably the first experience of major transformation and transition. And as so, it's been unfortunately, unfortunately, rather influential on people's thinking. 
And it goes with a story like this. In the year 1700, something like 55% of the, of the English labor force worked on the land. By the time we get to 1850, we're down to something like 22%. Okay, it's 150 years, but in those 150 years, there are enclosures of land, of the common land. There is consolidation of holdings, which sees the English peasantry, for the most part, forced off their land, and land concentrated into large estates and medium-sized family farms. It is a brutal transition, and historically, it is unnecessary. Why is it unnecessary? because our great rivals, but I hope we're friends these days, France, has a different story. Because in the year 1700, 63% of the French worked on the land, and by 1850, when only 22% were on the land in the UK, it was down to 55% in France. France had a gentle transition. There was no mass expulsion of the French peasantry from the land. And this doesn't seem to have harmed France's economic development compared to that of the UK. France had stronger land rights for the peasantry, enshrined, of course, by the revolution. Uh, Britain didn't have that experience. Uh, France shows you can have a much more benign transition. Some of you in the room will be saying, oh my goodness, the guy's talking about the 1700s. Uh, I have to deal with the 2010s. So let's look at a more contemporary experience. Thailand, 1960 Thailand is an overwhelmingly rural and agrarian society. Today it isn't. It's industrial, it's manufacturing, it's services and so on. And agriculture has become much smaller and it is an urbanized society. And that has all been done through the dynamism of small family farms. The average farm in the year 1960 in Thailand was three and a half hectares. Today it's about 3.2 hectares. In another decade it will get a little bit larger because the Thai uh, rural population is declining. But Thailand was able to make that progress with its small farms. And what Thailand did was truly remarkable because in the year 1960, the exports largely came from farming and natural resources with rice exports, teak exports, and so on. Since then, agriculture's productivity has gone up leaps and bounds, and Thailand has become a tropical New Zealand with its exports of fruit, vegetables, cassava chips, and so on. And Thailand once again proves that you can have benign transitions if you have the right kind of policy. Now just to give you some idea of how successful those Asian experiences can be, we've done some work at ODI on uh, rural wages in Asia. Now the story is, I'll just show you the story here from Vietnam, just to show you how the benefits of successful transformation actually percolate down. The rural poor in Asia tend to be unusually dependent on unskilled laboring, yeah? So we're really interested in unskilled labor wages. And what we're going to look at here is we're looking at unskilled wages in rural Vietnam, and we're taking it net of inflation, and we're running it from 1992 forwards uh, to the end of the data series I have, which is 2008. And I only want you to note two things from this graph. One is that the medium wage at the end of this period is three times the wage that it is at the start of the period. That is a magnificent achievement, yeah? Uh, in just under two decades, the wage has tripled. The other thing that's interesting there is that the regional wages, it's divided by eight different regions, the regional wages have converged. There's less regional variation at the end of this period than at the beginning. It's largely good news. It can be done. And yet, despite the many successes of transition and transformation in Asia, when we look at debates in contemporary sub-Saharan Africa, there is enormous gloom about the prospects for transformation and transition. And that gloom comes partly out of the interpretation of economic theory. 
And there are three components to that. One is there is long-standing writing in the economic literature that says that agriculture has limited potential for productivity gains, doesn't generate productive linkages within the economy in the way that other sectors do, and is subject to low and falling prices. In a word, the prospects of agriculture are grim, and you only have to go through the canon of economic literature, through the greats of the 19th century, and there is tremendous pessimism about the options for, for, for agriculture. More recently, thinking in economics, there is a line which says that innovation comes through manufacturing. That is where you learn to become more capable, more competent, yeah? You don't get it from agriculture. It's an extraordinarily powerful message in the writing of people like Danny Roderick, and it seems to totally ignore the little-known fact that the growth of labor productivity in agriculture has been stronger across the world over the last 20-odd years than it has been in manufacturing. Uh, surprising but true. I haven't got a slide on that. I can show you that on another occasion. And then, lastly, on our theoretical gloom, agglomeration economies, really important. It's great that economics has rediscovered agglomeration economies. I'm originally a geographer, and we knew about this yonks ago. But Paul Krugman rediscovered this with the new economic geography in the early 1990s, and it's been powerful thinking. Yes, urban areas are great for doing certain things. Agglomeration economies are wonderful. Urban economies are tremendous. That has put a gloss onto the urban economy that tends to throw agriculture into the shadow. So theoretically, we have reasons not to be cheerful. And empirically, we have the observation of Africa's limited transformation. And there are many ways you can look at this, and we'll come to it on the final slide. The Africa Center for Economic Transformation is now putting out regular reports on the state of transformation in Africa. And of course, the school report, the end of term report on agriculture is always gloomy, yeah? Not enough is transforming in Africa. We have growth in Africa, but we don't have the necessary transformations, the raising of productivity that we, we need. Yes, that may be true, the interpretation of it, however, may be discussed. And then astonishingly, I always find this astonishing, there's literature I read that says, oh, Asia may have been successful, but Asia was special. Asia had its special moment in history. Africa can't have that anymore. And I really wonder about that particular argument. I also want to look at the social differences and what they may mean through development, transformation, and transitions. And we start here by reminding ourselves of the simple empirics. What you're going to see here are Gini coefficients from the rural struct study conducted by Bruno Losch and colleagues in the mid-2000s, Bruno from CIRAD, uh, and they took some household surveys in 27 regions of seven countries across the developing world and constructed Gini coefficients. Now, if any of you here have done rural household surveys and constructed village-level Gini coefficients of inequality, you'll not be surprised. If you've not done that, I think you will be surprised. What you can see there is in most of those regions, the Gini coefficient is running at more than 0.4. Now, that's higher than what you would find, say, in contemporary Europe, where our Gini coefficient runs at something like 0.35 and considerably less in places like Scandinavia. But you'll even see regions there where you've got a Gini coefficient which is out at 0.5, and in some astonishing cases, 0.6. This is extraordinary inequality, yeah? And this is done in villages. I've done this in villages in Mexico and got similar results. And the villages where you go in there and you say, there are no landlords here, everybody's a small farmer, and they look pretty much the same. But when you do the rigorous studies, you do the accounting, you end up with very considerable inequality. So how do we characterize that inequality? Here is one scheme of doing it that comes from Andrew Dorwood from SOAS at the University of London. And I show you this because it's become tremendously influential in DFID in London. And Andrew Dorwood says, look, 
When you look at smallholders, you can divide them into three groups. One group have considerable potential to become almost full-time intensified commercial farmers. Their best option is to step up, to intensify and commercialize. Then there's a group with lesser endowments, lesser prospects, for whom the better options are not to step up in agriculture, but to step out into a diversified economy, into the rural non-farm economy, indeed into urban jobs. And then we've got a group who are of smallholders who are in effect marginalized by their lack of access to assets and probably by their geographical connectedness. And for them, the main option is the grim business of hanging in, surviving and subsisting and trying to avoid extreme poverty and destitution. That three-part division of the peasantry has become a very popular way of organizing thoughts in DFID. But this is a scheme that I particularly like for several reasons. This one comes from the Latin America Center for uh, Rural Development, RIMISP, in Santiago de Chile. This is the work of Julio Berdegué and his colleagues. And they conceptualize the difference in smallholders as that between having high assets and low assets, that's both land, water, education, skills, social contacts, and a horizontal dimension of difference, which makes the difference between a favorable and unfavorable environment, thinking of the environment both physically in terms of uh, the climate, the soils, and so on, and the connectedness to markets. And into that two-dimensional space, they then plot a group of farmers, class A, who are either advantaged by assets or advantaged by their environment, or both of those things. The polar opposite is the group C, who are marginalized in their access to uh, assets and in their environment, or both of those things. But whenever you work with these dichotomous schema, if ever you measure it in the field, you're always left with a lot of people who are betwixt and between, so you end up with a blob in the middle, B-class farmers who are neither particularly favored nor disadvantaged. Now, the reason I show you this one, apart from it in having a geographical dimension to it, is that RIMISP have been able to put some numbers on this. And working with some of their results for 12 Latin American countries, we can give you some estimate of how many percent are in those different categories. So in Latin America, we think we've got around about 3% of rural households who are running large-scale commercial farms. We think that that A group of smallholders, the ones who are in the best possible position for assets and environment, they're no more than 9%. The in-betweeners, the class B, makes up another 20%. 43% are in the marginal smallholder group, and there's 25% landless on top of that, yeah? Now, one of the interpretations of this diagram says this. If you leave things to the most basic of government policies and all the rest goes to the market, the only ones who are going to step up, intensify, and commercialize successfully are going to be 3% plus 9% equals 12% equals 88% either in poverty or looking for something else to do. That could mean mass movement to the cities, 12 versus 88. If we bring in the 20% with a more inclusive smallholder growth, we can go to roughly one-third, two-thirds. And we can expect the kinds of multipliers that we see in rural societies to generate an awful lot of additional jobs for more decent livelihoods for the other two-thirds. And we will expect, of course, a certain amount of migration to towns and cities. It's more feasible to see how this could be a decent transition with uh, inclusive outcomes if we can bring in those 20% of smallholders. Let's now look at what this pans out in policy. I've said on other occasions there are no big secrets to agricultural growth. 
Indeed, um, I can go a little bit further and I'll say that agricultural growth tends to happen unless you actually stop it happening by unwise policies. So there's a, a pretty big consensus on the, on the basics. The rural investment climate, that stable macroeconomy, its peace, its basic economic institutions, absolutely fundamental. Everybody knows that's important. It doesn't have to be perfect is the very important thing. It doesn't have to be World Bank circa 1990 perfect good governance. You just have to get rid of the big clunking problems. And if you want two examples of that, we don't have time to go through them in detail. Look at China in 1978-79. Look at Ghana in 1983. In both cases, there were reforms that improved the rural investment climate, but they never made it perfect. But then for at least two decades after, in both countries, you have rapid agricultural growth. And by the way, the agricultural growth of Ghana, I think, is faster than that of, of uh, China in that period. Uh, which just reminds us that sub-Saharan Africa can do it just as well as Asia, given the right conditions. The other part of the basics is we need to provide the rural public goods. There is huge econometric evidence from Asia of the very high returns to spending on rural public goods. So that's the physical infrastructure of roads, irrigation, power lines. It's the spending on people in health, education and clean water. And it's the spending on agricultural knowledge goods with research and extension. IFPRI has done a tremendous job in documenting how high the returns are to spending on public goods as opposed to spending on private goods. Now, beyond those basics, we start the challenges. And the biggest challenge that we face, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa for me, is what do we do about failing rural markets that mean that so few smallholders have access to credit, to any financial services, do not get ready access to high quality inputs uh, where they need them with the right kind of technical knowledge. Our factor markets tend to be failing quite badly. What do we do about that? Well, we have a big debate. One says markets fail, let's get the state back in, let's get the old marketing boards, let's go in with fertilizer subsidies and arrange it. And Malawi, of course, is our great iconic case of what can happen with a fertilizer subsidy. The alternative is private and collective institutional innovation, tracting farmer associations, things like the One Acre Fund, all kinds of exciting models where we try to get the institutions to work to remedy the factor markets. Now look, there's an element of differentiation here. Who suffers most from failing rural markets? It's the poorer smallholders, it's the women farmers. Getting, sorting out the failing markets is so important if we are to have inclusive development. I'll go as far as to say that on my judgment, on whether we can do this, whether we can sort out these rural market failures is absolutely critical for the future of rural Africa. Are we going to have the inclusive growth that I think all of us want or is it going to be a stilted growth that will leave many people in misery while a few gain? We have to have factor markets that work in decent ways and also efficient ways. So we need to have institutions that give us land transfers which are both efficient, so people who've got the means to farm the land get to them, and this does not mean large farms, by the way, it just means certain people and the smallholders, while decently rewarding those people who have that land as their heritage. And that can be through forms of land transfer, through sharecropping, through rentals, and only at a later stage may we see definitive exchange of title. It can be done, it's being done in many parts of the world, but you need the right kind of institutions with policy backup. And we need institutions that will allow us to transfer capital. And intriguingly, a lot of the agricultural development of Asia has taken place while capital has moved. It's moved from illiquid sources, first of all, cash under the mattress, old livestock, jewelry, into more liquid and productive forms of capital, but it's also moved quite strongly into urban areas once it's been in a liquid form. 
those are also challenges for benign transitions. If we can get the right kind of policies that give us the institutions, remedy the market failures, we've more chance of a benign transition. Our last element of policy is social protection for those who are marginalized and on low incomes, living often in extreme poverty. We've got lots of exciting advances in social protection over the last 20 years, amongst which we can name conditional cash transfers in Latin America and guaranteed employment programs in India. And we have African counterparts to those. One of our big challenges, however, is that challenge of how do we get the clients of social protection to graduate up, linking from social protection to uh, productive investments. That's a particular thing which is exercising FAO's imagination at the moment and also DFID. What are the priorities for development partners in this? Rather quickly. Encourage the basics. There's very strong evidence that rural investment climates and rural public goods is what is a sine qua non, necessary conditions for growth. Fund rural public goods in low-income countries where public, where public budgets do not extend sufficiently to provide the right kind of public goods. On the market failures, encourage trials, innovations. There is much to be learned through challenge funds on the side. But if you do that kind of thing, please invest in the learning. DFID is spending lots of money at the moment on rather interesting challenge funds and initiatives across Africa. Is it spending enough on learning? I suspect not. And pilot and learn from graduation schemes on social protection. Last slide and I finish. And this is a concluding reflection and perspective. And the very simple story here is beware framing that transition and transformation question in ways that lead us to gloom and pessimism and perhaps the wrong radical solutions. And I'm taking my text here from the story of Southeast Asia, not East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the good reasons why we're going to Southeast Asia. It looks a lot more like Africa 50 years ago. Uh, than East Asia does. And I'm taking my text from Henley and van Donche at Leiden in the Netherlands who wrote and who've written extensively on this, including a very good briefing paper in 2012. And the lessons they put is they say it's very simple what happened in Southeast Asia. For their agricultural development, a sound macroeconomy, and they stress don't let inflation go more than 20%, they talk about economic freedom for peasants and small entrepreneurs, and they talk above all about pro-poor, pro-rural public spending. And this isn't just spending on agriculture, it's the whole of the rural dimension. But they talk about Southeast Asian states having dedicated more than 20% of their public budgets to this. And they stress that it needs to be inclusive, not spending on a few favored large commercial farmers, but making it an inclusive spending. Now, the interesting thing is those are the two basics I got there. They're the rural investment climate and the rural public goods. Interestingly, they said there's no need historically in Southeast Asia for industrial policy. Much touted in East Asia, not necessary for what happened in Southeast Asia. And now my very final point, which doesn't come from Henley and van Donche, is this one. Patience. Transformation and transitions take time. In the case of Europe, we're dealing with 150 years or more to make those transitions. Asia has done brilliantly, and it's made those transitions, but I don't know of a case in Asia where it's taken less than 30 years. In debates on Africa, we are constantly setting targets for the next five years, and then we beat ourselves over the head five years later, and we say, we haven't transformed in Africa, somehow we're failing. No, the lesson from Asia is there are no magic bullets here. There's no super fast track. This is five times faster than Europe, but you do have to take the right kind of policies, be consistent, and stay with them. And if there's any genius of Asia, it is staying with the policies. 
And that is not some Asian magical story. Just to finish on a Chinese note, China tried everything before it got it right, yes? The Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and then Deng Xiaoping will just do the simple stuff, get it right, and let it go, and see what happens. And we have seen what happens. Patience, please. Thank you.